you very much. <clears throat> I'm pleased to introduce Ann Seuss, who is educated at Harvard, Stanford, and Princeton. <clears throat> but her passion turned to education. And after attaining a master's degree in education, she went on to teach science at the Stewart Country Day School and then at the Hunt School in Princeton. She also served as head of the upper school um, at the Stewart Country Day School. She became an educator of teachers as an AP consultant for the College Board, including presenting two to three week long institutes for teachers interested in teaching environmental sciences. In retirement, she has lectured in a number of areas, including the topic for today, climate change. She will talk about what climate is, why things are changing so rapidly, and steps that can be taken to undo some of the damage that we humans have done. And So the first challenge is to see if I can remember how to get things started here. Uh, uh, so I thought, so I thought this, that cartoon, this cartoon, which I saw, which I saw in the New Yorker, New Yorker just this past week, past might, week be, might be um, a good um, way, a good to, way begin. to begin. Um, um, I'm not sure how, not clearly, sure how you clearly you can see it, see it but basically the speaker, the speaker is, saying, is saying four horsemen, four horsemen are, great, but I have somebody, have somebody who can do it for half, price and half, price the, and half the, time, the time with the fifth, with horseman, the fifth horseman being, being climate, change. climate change. Now, now don't, don't see. Don't see. There we go. There we go. So, so here I've, here got, I've got a few headlines, a few headlines that I lifted, that I lifted from, from various newspaper various sources, sources just during, just during the, 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 month, the of month of July. So climate, so change, climate change has been has really, been really, really, really in the news, in the news much, more much more in the last few months, few months than I think it was, I think in, the was in the last few years. Few years as, as Becomes more and more, more and more a topic, a topic that, that people that really are really interested, are interested in learning more about. And about and more and more and more and more things happen. Things that happen indicate that indicate that climate, that change climate change may really may be really be for real. For real. So, so today, today um, I wanted to talk, wanted a, little to talk bit, a little bit. First of all, first of all, about some science, science and what it is, what it is that actually determines, determines climate, climate on Earth. Um, then, um, talk, then talk, something, talk something a little bit about, about how we predict, we predict climate, change climate change is going to, going to affect, affect the future. In the future. And finally, and finally touch, on touch on a few things a few that we things may be able to do to manage, to manage this change. This change. Uh, uh, all of these all of could be could be a whole course. A whole course. So so this is just this is just the surface. So climate, so climate is basically, is basically long, term long term weather. weather. That's the definition, That's the definition of, climate. of climate. And what determines, and what determines climate? climate? Well, basically, well, basically it's the, it's energy the energy coming, into, coming the into the earth from the sun. From the, sun. the sun is the, the sun only is the only external, external source, source of energy, of energy entering, the, entering earth. the earth and and as it enters, as it the, enters atmosphere, the atmosphere um some um, things some happen things some happen of the some of the energy coming from the sun from the sun before it actually reaches, reaches the earth i know we've I got, know we've a, got lot a lot of scientists, scientists in this room, in this room, so, room you, so you probably all probably recognize, all recognize the, the electromagnetic spectrum, spectrum. spectrum but you can but you can also see in the middle the radiation, the radiation wavelengths, wavelengths that are released, that are released by, by the sun. sun. And you can see, and you can most, see that of them, most of them are in the visual, are in the visual area. area. There are some, there are in, some the UV, in the UV, which is higher, which is energy, higher energy, and some, and some in infrared, in infrared uh, which, is uh, which is low energy. So that's the so energy, that's the energy coming, from the coming from the sun. It encounters, it encounters the atmosphere, the atmosphere around, the earth, around the earth and... and a lot of the, lot ultraviolet, of the ultraviolet radiation, radiation is, absorbed is absorbed by the, by ozone, the layer, ozone layer, which is in the which stratosphere. Is in so I'm not going so to labor, all, labor the all the different uh, le uh, levels, levels, in, levels the in the atmosphere, but the stratosphere, the stratosphere is where, is where there is there an ozone, is an layer, ozone that layer that can absorb a lot of UV coming, UV into, coming the into the Earth. And then underneath, and then underneath that, that, the layer of the, the layer atmosphere, atmosphere called the troposphere is where weather happens. But it's also but it's where also greenhouse, where greenhouse gases, gases, are gases are located. So a lot, so of, our a lot of our conversation today is today going to be, going about, to be events about events in the troposphere. In the troposphere. This graph, this graph simply, shows simply shows the, the different wavelengths, different wavelengths of, radiation of radiation 
coming into, coming the, into atmosphere, the atmosphere from the sun, from the sun and then those, and then and those and actually, actually reach, reach, the Earth's reach the Earth's surface. And you can, and see, you can see that, that a lot, a of, lot the of the solar radiation, radiation is absorbed, is absorbed by, by the atmosphere, the atmosphere before, before it ever reaches, reaches the Earth. Uh, just an uh, aside, just an aside really, life really life on land, on land was, was not possible, not possible until, until enough of an ozone, ozone layer developed, developed uh, uh, to absorb, to absorb the, the ultraviolet light, light that was reaching, the, reaching the, Earth's the Earth's surface. So I'd like, so to, I'd thank like to thank Professor, Professor Danny, Danny Sigmund at Princeton, at Princeton uh, for, this uh, for this diagram, which really which kind of really shows, kind of you shows you all the different all the things, things that can go that into, can go climate. into climate. Uh, starting uh, starting off, off with, with, as I said, as I said light coming light in, coming from, the in from the sun. So, so the sun releases this, this, this light, a lot, light, of, the, a lot of the light, light comes into, comes our, atmosphere, into our atmosphere, and a fair amount, fair amount of it is reflected, is reflected before, before it ever reaches, reaches the Earth's surface. surface. Uh, it can be reflected, uh, reflected from clouds. From clouds. It can be it can reflected, reflected from, ice from ice and snow. And that and reflectivity, reflectivity is called, is called albedo. albedo. But but fair amount of fair sunlight, amount of sunlight, sunlight energy, energy reaches the Earth's surface, the Earth's surface which, is that, which is that green line, green line that, you that you can see, and is absorbed, and is absorbed <laughs> as heat as heat. So then so that then heat, that heat. Can be transported, can be transported from, from where it's absorbed, absorbed uh, to areas, uh, to areas that, are that are colder, and that can and happen, that can either, happen through either through wind currents, wind currents or water or water currents. But in addition, but in addition a lot of that, lot of that can, be can be absorbed. Some by soil, some by soil but much but more much so more by so water, by water, particularly, particularly the, oceans, the oceans, which make up a very, very large, very large part of the earth. Of the earth. Eventually, eventually, that is re-radiated back. Some of it some passes, of it passes right, through, the right through the atmosphere and, and, back and back into outer space. Outer space. And some of, and it, some is of it is absorbed by greenhouse, by greenhouse gases, gases that, that are in the troposphere. And those gases, and those gases absorb, absorb the energy, energy stored in the, form of in the vibration, 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 but then eventually, then eventually release, it release it again. And that, and and that, that energy can either go into outer space or it can be reflected back to the Earth. So, so basically, basically what's controlling, what's controlling the Earth's Earth's temperature, temperature is the balance, is balance between what's, between coming, what's in coming in and what's going, and what's out. going out. If the two, if the two are, are equal, then Earth's then temperature, Earth's temperature remains, pretty remains pretty much constant. Much constant. If there's, if more, there's sunlight more sunlight coming in, coming in the temperature, the temperature will, go will go up. If there's, if less, there's heat less heat out, going the out, temperature the temperature will go up. Will go up. So, so we can look we at can each, look one, of each one of these things, things turn, and turn to see these which of humans these can humans have, can some, have effects some effects on or not, or not, and which can and be which actually, be actually driving, driving the climate the change or the temperature, the temperature changes, changes that we're seeing. So I'm going to so go. I'm going to go each through one of those, one of those in, turn. in turn. The reflectivity in the Earth. Um, are we reflecting more sunlight or less sunlight than previously? Has there been a change in the greenhouse gas concentration in the troposphere? And if so, what effect is that having? Has there been a change in solar output? Is the sun shining more brightly or less brightly than it was? in the past, and could that have affected Earth's temperature? Has there been a change in heat transfer, either by wind or water, from areas that are warmer to areas that are cooler? And finally, has there been a change in heat storage and heat release by the oceans? So all of those things could be affecting our climate. So let's take them one at a time, uh, starting with the Earth's albedo. The picture on the left, and I'm not sure how well you can see some of those numbers, basically shows you the albedo of some different kinds of surfaces. An albedo of one is perfectly reflective. An albedo of zero means that all of the light energy is absorbed. Snow, ice have fairly high albedos. Water has a very low albedo, which means it can absorb a lot of energy and change it into heat. So what effect have humans had on albedo? Well, it's interesting that forests have a relatively low albedo. So deforestation and conversion to um, cities or cropland has actually increased the Earth's albedo, and that should lead to cooling if we've done enough of it, which it turns out we haven't. 
Um, there are local effects of albedo um, in the Arctic and the Antarctic. As temperature rises, sea ice melts. As sea ice melts, it exposes more water, which has a very low albedo. The water can absorb more energy, warm up, and melt even more sea ice. So there's a positive feedback loop that can affect amount of sea ice in northern and southern hemispheres. Uh, but overall, we think that human activities have really had almost no effect on overall on the Earth's albedo. So humans changing albedo may have local effects, but not global effects. So now let's go to the big one, the greenhouse effect. Um, the two most important greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere over Earth's history have been water vapor and carbon dioxide. That's been known for a long time, almost two centuries. Without these two gases in the atmosphere, the Earth would actually be very, very cold, um, around zero degrees Fahrenheit, as opposed to an average temperature of around 57. So greenhouse gases are our friends up to a point. So in order to be a greenhouse gas, what do you need to be? Well, you need to have three or more atoms. Um, so the three most common gases in the atmosphere, which are nitrogen, oxygen, and argon, can't be greenhouse gases. So water, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, halocarbons, and ozone, all located in the troposphere, do have the capability of acting as greenhouse gases. Water vapor is not something that's under human control. The amount of water that is in the atmosphere depends on the temperature of the Earth. So while the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere go, may go up as the temperature warms, it's not that humans are adding it directly. So the gases that are outlined in red are what can act as climate forcers or climate drivers. These are the gases that we humans can add to the troposphere that are actually going to change the Earth's temperature. And you can see there, carbon dioxide, methane, etc. cetera. Um, carbon dioxide is by far the most, has present in the highest percentage, and that's why we're most concerned about it. Methane, however, has a much stronger warming potential than carbon dioxide does. It's about 30 times better at trapping heat and re-radiating it back to Earth. And we're going to look at what's happening to methane in the atmosphere a little bit later because that's kind of concerning. So greenhouse gas concentrations have changed over time and they're probably playing a very, very large part in global warming. So now let's think about light from the sun. Is the sun producing more energy that's hitting the earth to warm the earth? And the answer seems to be no. Uh, the amount of solar irradiance has remained pretty much constant as best we can figure it out for the last several hundred years, but it's only the few, last few years that the temperature has really been increasing rapidly. So if we look at a plot of temperature and irradiance, you can see that irradiance remains pretty much constant, uh, but temperature is showing a significant increase. Well, maybe it's sunspots. Maybe there are more sunspots and they're somehow causing the temperature on Earth to go up. Well, if we look at this graph, we can see that the number of sunspots graphed over the past 150 years or so is actually decreased a little bit. But we notice that the blue line, which represents carbon dioxide in parts per million and temperature are moving in what looks like almost total synchrony. And I might just point out that from 1960 on, you'll notice that the blue line goes up and down in a little bunch of saw teeth. Um, this is what's called the Keeling Curve. And it's data that comes from the top of one of the volcanoes on the Big Island in Hawaii. Um, and the ups and downs represent the winters and summers as carbon dioxide goes up in the winter when northern hemisphere plants are and more not photosynthesizing and down in the summer. 
One of the things that humans are not having very much of an effect on at all is the passage of the Earth around the sun in the yearly cycle. But there have been a couple of reports recently about the fact that humans are pumping out so much groundwater that the actual axis of the Earth's inclination may have changed a tiny, tiny bit. Uh, so that's a new, new science, and it hasn't changed enough to have any effect at all. Uh, the thing that's important here, I think, in this diagram is that you can see that the area of the tropics are the area that get the greatest amount of sunshine and therefore the greatest energy input. So when we look at how energy moves, heat energy is going to be moved from these tropics uh, towards the colder regions. So now let's look at how heat is transported around the globe, both by air and water. Atmospheric convection currents are basically giant bands that go around the Earth that are driven by heat energy from the sun. They act to move heat from areas that are warmer to areas that are cooler and vice versa. The fact that the Earth is rotating under these convection cells produces what are called the prevailing winds due to something called the Coriolis effect. And the trade winds um, blow towards the equator. And then you can see above and below the horse latitudes, the westerlies. If you think about the weather maps you see in Princeton, our weather nearly always comes from the west. That's because we're in the region of the westerlies. And then farther north and south, the polar easterlies. So these are surface wind currents that are powered by the convection cells but then the direction that the wind currents go in is also determined by the Coriolis effect. Now those surface winds blow over the ocean and so they produce surface ocean currents. And you can see um, in this diagram that there are two major gyres or circular ocean currents in the Atlantic and then three, sorry, in the Northern Hemisphere and three in the Southern Hemisphere. And you may notice that in the Northern Hemisphere, they all seem to be moving clockwise and in the Southern Hemisphere, counterclockwise. And that's also due to the Coriolis effect. So, and to the shape of the ocean basin. So these currents like the air currents are constantly moving warmth away from the tropics and cooler water towards the tropics. And then the last thing, heat storage by the ocean. This has been a way something that's saved us so far from really rapid increases on Earth, but is also going to not save us uh, in the long run because water has, for all the chemists in here, a high heat capacity, which means that it takes a lot of heat energy to get its temperature up by just one degree. So the oceans have been warming and basically absorbing a lot of the heat that could otherwise have made our Earth's temperature rise. It has a downside though, because if we can ever get our greenhouse gases under control, it's gonna take a long time for the Earth to cool off again. So this is what we've talked about so far. Um, Change in albedo is really not a part of climate change. Change in greenhouse gas concentration definitely is. Uh, change in solar output and variations in the Earth's orbit and tilt, no. Change in heat transfer through water and wind, yes, locally, but overall globally, no. And change in heat storage and release by the oceans, Yes, but that's directly in response to the increase in greenhouse gases that we've added to the troposphere. So our problem is basically that we are adding greenhouse gases, primarily CO2, to the Earth's atmosphere at an unprecedented rate. And while there are lots of natural feedbacks that should be able to remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, the amount we're adding is so enormous 
that nature can't keep up with us. So this graph here shows CO2 in the atmosphere going back about 400,000 years. Uh, you can see that it rises and falls in a pretty regular way. The peaks are interglacials. The valleys are glaciation. And you can see that we were coming out of a glacial period. We were in an interglacial. The prediction was before people realized how much CO2 we were adding to the atmosphere. And in fact, the earth was going to get colder again and go back into another ice age. Uh, but then if you look at the purple and the red line, you can see that the CO2 has really increased enormously. And so the prospect of an ice age looks a little less likely right now. So let's take a look at some horrible examples of what could happen to CO2 um, and to the Earth's temperature, depending on some different scenarios. Uh, the first one is, let's imagine the worst possible case. We keep on burning fossil fuels until we burn them all up. Uh, the estimate is that we might be able to do that um, by about 2400, at which point we have raised the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere from about 400 parts per million to up close to 2,000 parts per million. Okay, we run out of fossil fuels, so we can't keep adding them to the atmosphere. So now, what happens to the carbon dioxide? Well, you can see the bad news is that it takes a long, long, long time to get back to anywhere close to where it was before we started the process. Um, in fact, all of the natural processes are geologically fairly rapid, but in human terms, very unrapid. And we would probably not get back to where we are or were now until about a million years which is a short time in geologic scale, but a really, really long time for humans. So let's take a look at temperature and CO2 if we aren't quite so extreme. So the top graph here shows you three different scenarios in terms of the maximum amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, 550 parts per million, that would be really optimistic, uh, 850 and 1200. You can see that once the CO2 is released, it takes it still millennia to go down again. And if you look at the temperature graph, which is the lower graph, you can see that even at the 550 parts per million, it's predicted that the Celsius temperature would go up by about four degrees, which is about seven degrees Fahrenheit, which is really, really significant. And because of the ability of the oceans to store heat and then gradually release it, it takes a long time to cool off. So I think the takeaway here is that what we do now is going to be with us for a long time to come. The other thing that a warming climate can do is get more water vapor into the atmosphere. And when more water is in the atmosphere, what goes up has to come down. And it often comes down in more extreme precipitation events. So I've got a couple of graphs here, and then I'm going to show you an animation. The top graph shows predictions on what will happen to temperature as, temp uh, temperature as the climate warms. You can see that the mean shifts to the right. Things get warmer. But you can also see that the two tails of the graph shift to the right as well. So the prediction is many fewer extreme cold and cold events and many more extreme heat or very hot events. We're seeing those now. And then the precipitation graph on the bottom shows that we can expect more variation in terms of precipitation. Wet areas will get wetter in terms of sudden brief downpours. Uh, drier areas will get drier. 
So this really short animation shows you how land temperatures have changed since 1951. It sort of looks like it's alive. But notice fewer and fewer extreme cold, more and more extreme warm. So really a pretty significant change since 1950. Now, we're also seeing more heavy precipitation events. If you think of your own house and your own gutters, uh, you've probably experienced some of these even this summer. And the predictions are uh, that as temperatures warm, extreme storms will get wetter and wetter. So we can expect more torrential downpours. So these charts show predicted uh, climate change and temperature changes for different areas on Earth. Um, the ones on the left are showing, le are showing temperatures um, and an uneven distribution of temperatures. Uh, if the global temperature increases by 1.5 degrees, you can see most of the warming takes place in the northern hemisphere, extreme north. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that land has a much lower heat capacity than the oceans do, and there's much more land in the northern hemisphere. So it's not surprising it warms up more. If we look at a global change of three degrees, you can see that warming is everywhere, but it's still more concentrated in the north. In terms of precipitation, the same thing is true. Um, we see, in general, more precipitation in the north as it warms. But there are a couple of things that are very alarming that you may notice. One is that in either of the two scenarios, the Amazon basin becomes significantly drier. And that's really bad news for tropical rainforests in South America. The other thing which is more obvious in the lower picture than the upper picture is that there's really extreme drought that extends across Southern Europe and the Middle East place where there are already water wars, and that's going to really exacerbate the situation. And there are a couple of interesting things as well, because it looks like the sub-Saharan region or the southern part of the Sahara may get significantly more water. This is another really short video, and it's going to show you climate change through time. Um, you'll notice that on the left-hand side, there's a little scale that shows you warmer than, colder than. And we start back in the 1850s, I believe, maybe 1880s, and go up to the present. And the time is projected across South America. So change is coming, but change has been coming more and more rapidly as we get closer and closer to the present. And one of the things I want you to notice is that little blue area just south of Antarctica, uh, south of Greenland. That's probably due to meltwater from the Greenland ice sheet. And that's important for ocean circulation. So rising temperatures are going, so what are some of the effects? Well, rising temperatures are certainly going to cause sea level to rise. Sea ice is going to decline, which will have a big effect on the animals that have evolved to depend on the sea ice to live. But melting sea ice is not going to change ocean water levels. To do that, we need to have thermal expansion or we need to have melting of land-based glaciers, and ice sheets. 
So these are some predictions about how much the ocean could rise based on various scenarios. Uh, remember that a meter is about three feet if you want to translate from meters into feet. So thermal expansion, about a foot for every degree that the ocean warms. You're probably aware that the ocean in Florida this summer has been over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, um, warmer than body temperature. That's probably due to the fact that in the Caribbean, sea level has risen more than expected. Uh, melting of mountain glaciers uh, can raise, if they all melted, it could raise sea level about a foot. The three big ones are the ice sheets that are currently on land that could melt some or entirely. Greenland could give us about 21 feet of sea level rise. The West Antarctic ice sheet, which is a small one, about 15 feet. And the East Antarctic ice sheet, if that were to go entirely, would be over 150 feet of increase in sea level. Some of the other effects that increase uh, CO2 and warming are having is, first of all, CO2, when it dissolves in water, forms an acid. There are a lot of important organisms in the ocean that are the base of food chains, especially ones called foraminifera, that make little shells of calcium carbonate. As the ocean waters acidify, these shells weaken, and a lot of the organisms are threatened. Some of them die. We've seen extreme droughts and also extreme precipitation events just this summer. And one of the things we know is that nature can adapt if it's given enough time. But when we see things changing as quickly as they are today, a lot of animals and plants simply can't evolve or move as fast as they need to. Oops. So about 20 years ago, this group called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, developed a theory of things they called tipping points. And these were environmental events, critical points that if we went beyond them could cause a whole cascade to occur. Kind of like a ball going up the top of the hill. If it passes the tipping point, it starts rolling irreversibly down the hill. I think of it as kind of like a bunch of dominoes set up. If you hit the one and it's a tipping point, the whole kitten caboodle goes down. And for sure, one tipping point can affect other tipping points. So at the time that they came up with this idea, they thought we wouldn't even need to worry about tipping points until we got to a global temperature increase of about 5 degrees C. But what we're discovering is that these tipping points are a lot closer than we thought they were. Uh, so the six tipping points that the IPPC came up with were Greenland ice sheet collapse, West Antarctic ice sheet collapse, coral reef die off in the low latitudes. If you were reading the New York Times this summer, you know that some of the coral reefs off the Key West and the Florida Keys were suffering uh, coral bleaching and dying because the temperatures were simply too high for the coral organisms to exist. So that's something that we're seeing in some places now, not in the future. Uh, sudden thawing of permafrost in the northern regions. Uh, this would be in the tundra in Canada and Siberia. Uh, it's believed that, well, it's known there's a ton of methane that's locked in the permafrost. The permafrost melts is going to cause an explosive release of methane into the atmosphere, something humans can't control. And remember that methane is 30 times as potent as CO2. Um, abrupt loss of sea ice in the northern and southern, uh, at near the northern southern poles loss of biodiversity and habitat. Uh, we've seen that already. And collapse of ocean circulation. Um, this is the real kind of doomsday scenario that has been proposed, poo-pooed, and now proposed again. So I wanted to take just a minute to explain to you what it is and why it's so important. So we're going to look at something called the ocean conveyor belt. 
this is a non, um, this is another silent movie, my last movie. And what it's going to show us is surface currents and then deep ocean currents transporting heat around the globe. I hope this shows up okay in here. So you should be able to begin to see white arrows um, moving from the equatorial region up um, through the Atlantic. These are surface currents. Uh, this could have been the Gulf Stream. When those surface currents get up in the region of Greenland, um, they cool. They're quite salty because the water has, has evaporated because of warmth. And so the combination of cold and salty makes them sink. And they sink all the way to the ocean floor, and they run south right down the middle of the Atlantic, all the way to Antarctica. And when they run into Antarctica, uh, they take a turn to the east. Remember, they're still carrying cold water. They move around Antarctica, and then they branch out. Uh, some rise up to the surface in the Indian Ocean, where they gradually warm and then join the surface ocean currents carrying warmth back up and join the, the Gulf Stream, and others move into the Pacific. So this whole conveyor belt, and this is a diagram which may make things just a little bit clearer, this whole conveyor belt is basically carrying heat from the tropics to the north and carrying cold water back to the tropics to be reheated. So area one here is the Gulf Stream, area two is where the water sinks. And then you can see that it, uh, some of it rises in the Indian Ocean and some rises all the way over in the Pacific. Now remember that blue spot that I showed you south of Greenland. That is fresh water. Fresh water is less dense than salty water. That fresh water won't sink. So it could interfere with this whole conveyor belt by preventing the sinking of the cold water carrying heat back. That could cause the Gulf Stream to slow down. We don't have very good measurements on the Gulf Stream, but recent ones seem to indicate that the Gulf Stream is indeed slowing. It could stop entirely. And what we know from history is that it has stopped entirely in the past at the end of the last ice age when a lot of freshwater lakes suddenly burst through their ice dams and dumped a lot of fresh non-salty water into the ocean. It can happen in as little as 10 or 15 years. And it does restart, but it takes it about 10,000 years to do so. So if you think about what the implications of this are for a few minutes, it would make the East Coast of the United States considerably warmer, and it would make a lot of Europe considerably colder. No more palm trees in England. And the last thing I wanted to touch on is methane. Um, this is a graph that I found just about a week or so ago, so this is a new addition to the talk. You can see that our measurements of methane show an increase, then a leveling off, and then an increase again. Uh, methane can be released from fossil fuel ex exploration, processing, um, cow farts or cow burps, um, ruminant organisms, let's say, um, and decay uh, anaerobically of organic matter. The first increase in this during the 80s and 90s is primarily due to fossil fuel extraction. At that time, natural gas was not such a valuable commodity as it is now. So a lot of natural gas was just being released into the atmosphere. Then you can see that the amount of methane in the atmosphere kind of levels off. That's probably due to capture of methane by fossil fuel producing companies because now they could sell the methane and make a lot of money off of it. 
But you'll notice that methane has started to go up again. That's not due to fossil fuels anymore. We believe that that's probably due to melting of permafrost. And that, when it starts, is uncontrollable. There's nothing humans can do about it unless we can get the temperature down again. So that's very concerning. Um, and this is a very concerning graph. So what now? Well, money drives a lot of what we do. So it's going to have to be financially advantageous for us, and I'm thinking humans here, uh, to begin to fight climate change. And I think we're close to a point where spending money on fighting climate change may actually be financially advantageous. We know a lot about what some of the steps are that we can take. We just need to take them. But I think one of the biggest problems we have, and this is speaking philosophically, is that a lot of people don't understand what's meant by exponential change or exponential growth. And so I think your average man in the street thinks that things are just going to go linearly. And they don't understand that there's a doubling and a doubling and a doubling so that things can really kind of explode on you um, a lot faster than you thought they would. So here's our problem. Um, we're adding a lot of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, and we basically need to get this all the way to zero or as close as we can. So what can we do? Well, a lot we're doing already in terms of increasing efficiency. Uh, shifting to LED light bulbs, shifting to heat pumps as opposed to gas boilers if you're going to replace your heating system, shifting to renewable energy and nuclear energy, uh, neither of which release the amount of CO2 that burning fossil fuels do. But if we can't get down to zero that way, then there's something else we could think about trying, and that's called carbon capture and sequestration. And that basically involves pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, capturing it, and sequestering it, putting it somewhere. So CCS, carbon capture and sequestration, basically have a natural way of happening and a technological way of happening. Nature's way is primarily through photosynthesis, which can have a fairly rapid, immediate effect. Uh, so planting trees is a really good thing to do. Uh, besides using up CO2, they can also produce shade, lower local temperatures somewhat, um, and provide habitat for organisms. The slow process is natural rock weathering, which takes millions of years. Or we can use technology. Uh, we know how to capture CO2 from the atmosphere. We can do it directly through what's called direct air capture. There's a very, very small plant in Iceland that was in the news last year that was doing DAC or direct air capture. But it's easier to capture CO2 if you're basically sitting on top of a smokestack where the CO2 concentration is already really, really high. And we can do that through a variety of chemical means. In fact, there are a lot of com companies that are doing it right now. So then we've got to do something with that CO2 once we capture it. Uh, the companies that are capturing CO2 right now primarily are fossil fuel companies that are using the CO2 to pump down into the earth to push more oil and natural gas out. Uh, the other thing we can look for is a way to permanently store CO2 underground somehow. And there have been some CO2 pipelines proposed that have come under a lot of criticism from people who live near the pipelines because they don't really want a CO2 pipeline in their backyards. But we're going to have to do something. Or we're going to have to live with the consequences. So I'm going to end with an analogy. Uh, 
Bacteria are living in a bottle. They've been living there forever, since 12.01 a.m. And their population doubles every minute. It's now 11.58, and the bottle that they live in is a quarter full. But it's only a quarter. And it's taken them all that time to get there. So they know they really don't have anything to worry about. So these bacteria don't understand exponential growth. When are they going to run out of room? Well, the answer is they're going to run out of room in two minutes. So they've got very little time left to act. And I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions about how humans and bacteria are the same or different. So with that, thanks for your time. Thanks you. Thanks you. Here, stay right here. Okay. Q&A. Uh, thank you very much, Anne, for that uh, talk, as scary as it is. Uh, okay, so Roger, you get the first one. Thank you, Mark. Uh, by chance, I happened to read an article in the latest issue of Forbes magazine this week. It's about two fellows who have an idea that they can capture carbon and sell it to, to outfits that are looking for carbon credits. Their idea is to take uh, the byproducts of uh, forestry lumber, the, the parts that are not able to be used for construction, and bury them in abandoned coal mines or uh, caves and then seal it so the carbon captured can't get out. Uh, uh, they were optimistic about having federal incentives uh, come for that, which did not come. Uh, I think there was a contribution from Bill Gates uh, that helped sponsor them. Just maybe have your thoughts on that. I do. And for those of you who subscribe to Chemical and Engineering News, anybody in here know that magazine? Okay. They had a great um, whole issue article on carbon capture and sequestration, I think in fall of 21. Um, so you can learn a lot about carbon capture that way. Any way that we can capture carbon would be really, really beneficial. What the Bush administration did with uh, sulfur dioxide and tr trading credits for dirty coal, clean coal, capturing uh, sulfur dioxide was very, very effective in getting this amount of SO2 down in the atmosphere. So I think carbon capture and carbon credits could be very effective as well because money talks. And if you can make money from it, I think it's got a good chance of working. Alia? Uh, well, thank you for a chilling talk about a non-chilling topic. Um, a number of years ago, I was talking to an atmospheric scientist at NASA who said that we could not accurately predict the weather in 10 or 14 days into the future because weather is a chaotic system. Uh, how about climate? Is climate a chaotic system? And can how far into the future can we predict climate? I think in many ways, it's probably easier to predict climate change than weather changes, because climate is long term. Now, the other thing I'd say, though, is that our computing power has really, really increased enormously. And so predictions that were not possible at all 20 years ago are now much more reliable because of the computing power that we have. So I would agree that predicting the weather two weeks in the future is really hard, but I would also say that predicting climate change over the long haul may have fewer ups and downs or blips in it uh, than weather prediction. My name is Edward Ack, and it was a very interesting talk. Can I ask you back with the hurricanes? Are like there's two with Galley and Franklin are both 
being steered looks like toward the north and northeast. Is what is that caused by climate or what's causing them to be steered that direction? So hurricanes are um, a favorite topic of a lot of people. Are we having more because of climate change? The answer is no. But are we having stronger hurricanes with higher precipitation? And the answer to that is yes, because global warming is simply pumped more water into the atmosphere. Now, what makes a hurricane move one way or another are those short-term weather changes. Where is a high pressure system? Where is a low pressure system? Where are the upper level winds? But the hurricane that's about to hit Florida is in water that is unprecedentedly warm. And that's going to strengthen the hurricane. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, okay. The question is about nuclear nuclear power, how can we have more emphasis on this carbon-free energy product? Um, what is currently being done? So first of all, I'd like to thank you for saying that I gave a good talk because it always makes a speaker feel good when someone says that. Um, so nuclear energy, that's a really tough one. It's very dependable. It can produce a lot of energy without releasing much CO2. Our big problem with nuclear energy is coming to grips with what we can do with the radioactive waste. If we could actually find decent repositories for the waste, and if we could improve on the technology we use to build nuclear power plants so that they would be less expensive in their construction. Nuclear power is a wonderful source of energy that runs day or night. You can use it when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. But I think the storage, um, and there are new designs being developed for much smaller power plants that would probably be much more effective. But there's a lot of I think there's a lot of environmental fear about nuclear energy in general. Um, you only have to look at Fukushima, which has been storing radioactive water now ever since the power plant was inundated. They finally run out of storage space and they've had to release that radioactive water into the ocean. Probably it's not gonna have that big of an effect because the ocean is big and the amount of water, while huge by human standards, is not huge by ocean standards. But nuclear waste disposal, I think, is the real key. And shooting it into outer space is not the answer. Uh, the next Ron online, Ron Hoke. Thank you much for a, a very interesting talk. Uh, uh, somebody before said it was a good uh, uh, lecture. I, I want to raise the ante a little bit and say it was an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, two issues that I think have been underestimated uh, that you brought up uh, th that I'd like to emphasize. The first is the issue of exponential increases and tendencies to cause climate change. The first is the increase in tendency to vaporize water. A measure of that is the increase in vapor pressure of water as the temperature increases. That's an exponential function, which means that a one degree increase in temperature of the water when the water is already warm does a much greater thing in increasing the tendency of the water to evaporate when the water is cold. So there's another case of another uh, incident of uh, positive feedback. Uh, another thing is that when the water evaporates uh, from the seas, from the oceans to produce water vapor, it not only uh, sends that vapor, water vapor up into the atmosphere, but it also has to add a lot of energy to it. 
a lot of energy has to be added to water liquid to make it into a vapor. So when the water vapor uh, goes up into the atmosphere where it's cool, it not only produces liquid water, but it also releases a tremendous amount of energy. And the combination of those two things, water in liquid water in the atmosphere and energy, is what drives the uh, increase in uh, in hurricanes that we're seeing so much. Uh, the, the other point that you emphasize, which is, is very important, is positive feedback loops. Uh, one of the reasons that many of the scientists who predicted uh, climate change underpredicted it was because they did not take into account positive feedback loops as much as they should have. Thank you very much. Uh, well, that wasn't exactly a question. Uh, next, I think, uh, Bill Tittle. Uh, yeah, just a wonderful talk. Um, I, I worked in the chemical and energy industry, so I've been through this uh, my whole career. I worked in uh, carbon uh, capture and sequestration projects. And uh, it's a little cynical question, but I, I think um, there's a technical solution issue here to dealing with climate change. But there's as much a political a dimension because even if we have solutions uh i'm getting the point where i i i, I doubt um the majority of people you know like half the people think that donald trump was elected president so um can you think of any historical example where the world not not the united states not uh, new jersey or something the world faced a uh, existential threat and they dealt with it it could be tb i don't know i mean maybe there there are good examples but i can't think of one of this magnitude i can actually think of one example and that would be smallpox one of the reasons that the americans won the revolutionary war is that George Washington insisted that all of his troops be vaccinated. And that meant when smallpox swept through the British army, the American army was hardly affected at all. So I think accepting the germ theory of disease and accepting that vaccination was something that would actually save millions and millions of lives, it's maybe less of an existential threat as we look at it now, but I think when if we were living in the 1780s or 1790s, knowing that if you got smallpox, it was a death sentence, that might have been the kind of thing that changed people's minds. So I still have hope, but I have to admit that that time is getting shorter and shorter. Yes. Last question. And the last question from John McKenna. Okay. Thank you. It is a truly wonderful talk, and I learned a lot. I have a question about methane. It appears to me that the methane may become more and more significant component of, of uh, contributing to global warming, particularly with the situation of uh, warming up the Siberia and uh, tundra, where you have great releases of methane from decaying matter. Are there any efforts to sequester methane the way we are thinking about sequestering CO2. Another question I have is, would it make more sense perhaps to try to burn the methane, although we are producing CO2 in the process, but it would seem to me that the resultant CO2 will be less harmful than the methane itself. Those are two really great questions to end on. Um, the first one is sequestering methane. One thing I didn't mention is that methane has a lifetime in the atmosphere of only about 10 to 20 years. So if we can stop producing it, it'll go down pretty rapidly, unlike CO2, which has a lifetime of hundreds of years, unless we start pulling it out. Uh, the second question is, could we capture the methane 
I'm not sure how to do that, but I'm sure there's a way to do it and burn it because CO2 has less of an effect than methane. The answer would be in the short run, that would be okay. But in the long run, we're going from something with a lifetime of 10 years to a lifetime of a few hundred years. So that's a trade-off that would really need some careful calculations, but it's a great question. That uh, was a wonderful talk. Um, we all appreciate it. Um, here uh, at the Old Guard, we have two ways of um, thanking you. Uh, first, <clears throat> we have a certificate of appreciation, um, which has an orchid on it. And um, for our women uh, presenters, uh, we, we give a um, uh, an orchid, usually a corsage. But I um, would like to give you a live orchid um, um, as soon as possible. I'll uh, present that to you. Um, and uh, we also have a second uh, type of appreciation, which is an old god salute. That was wonderful. Thank you very much.